Hi everyone, Josh Krieger here live. It's the Edge of NFT again, and I'm here with none other than the chairman of Animoca Brands, Yatsu. It's great to see you in person. It's been a minute, but it's more so like passing by each other. It's been, we've been flying through Singapore, Korea, and now uh, we're in Dubai. Actually, we're not in Dubai, we're in Ras, but um, we've been in the Middle East region for a few weeks running into each other. Why is, you've traveled the world, why is this region important to Animoca brands and to the overall blockchain landscape? So first of all, the Middle East is generally super exciting. Demographically, it's a very young population. Um, a large part of the gaming community actually is coming from here in terms of emerging. When you look at a place like Saudi, I think something like 85 or 86% of the population is under the age of 36 and they love gaming. It's one of the highest ARPU markets in the world. Interesting. Right? Uh, when you even look at other markets, well, like say like Turkey or Egypt, uh, young market as well in terms of in terms of population and very much interest in all sorts of things of asset and of course same, same same type of games as like Asia or like have you kind of delved into what types of games they like to play here? Well, most of the games that uh, people play here are sort of uh, first-person shooters, um, you know, um, and RPGs, very similar to what you see in the West, and some games from Asia. But I would say mostly it's Western game studio games that are playing here. But a deep interest and a hunger to create new, very specific domestic titles that actually speak to the local market. And that's actually the opportunity that we and others see as well here in terms of a, th a strong, thriving local market that actually has a hunger to develop it. I mean, take Saudi as an example. It has an esports ministry and it has a sovereign gaming fund. I can't think of many countries, if any, that, for instance, has that kind of commitment, for instance. Yeah. And then when you think about the level of investment that happens, for instance, here in the UAE, um, whether this is in Abu Dhabi or whether this is in Dubai, in things of like digital assets, and sort of Web3, broadly speaking, this is one of the most sort of uh, diverse investment places that you can find um, and interest in the space, for instance. So, yeah, I think there's many reasons to be here uh, for, for all sorts of reasons. And, and for others as well that are, you know, uh, Coinbase is, is considering yes. in this region. Uh, would you touch upon like why it's important for, for non-gaming uh, yes. companies? Uh, are you advocating they also sort of have a presence here? I think so. I mean, first of all, particularly when you see what's happening in places like the U.S., people are sort of you know, wanting to go somewhere where you have a little bit of clarity, where you have now know what's going on. A playbook. On. Some yeah, kind a playbook. of playbook. Yeah, to say, hey, you know, this is okay. Or Even if it's 1,300 pages, give yes, us a playbook. Tell us what to do. And right now, yeah. because of the way that things are being enforced uh, without real clarity, uh, even the likes of giants like Coinbase are finding their way having to sort of consider offshore places where they have at least some clarity so they can actually conduct these valuable services that they do. Uh, so, so I think to me though, this region and other places like Hong Kong for instance are similar in this, in this regard, actually is positive because it's also good to have a little bit of global competition, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, people need to know where the talent is gonna go. And if the talent can't stay in one place because it's hostile, then they'll go somewhere else because talent is super mobile. And I think the regions like this demonstrate that it's fluid. I mean, just look at how many people from around the world are in Dubai, for instance. It's super international now. Yeah, we, we, we've seen that people move quickly. They're, they're willing yeah. to sort of migrate. That nomadic tendency takes over. You want to find a place where you can innovate and be creative and not have you know, boundaries, right? Correct. So that makes Correct. a lot of sense. Speaking of innovation, you know, I remember fondly our first show where I got to meet you where you shared your story of sort of your your fight with uh with Apple in the yes, early days exactly. and yes. and in like you know the fight doesn't stop right so um you know just to paraphrase you had some you know multiple award winning games uh, at the top of the charts and then you got kicked you off got the platform absolutely right yeah. and 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 so pushing the envelope is sort of in your DNA and the DNA of culture of Inamoka brands and you're doing that again with uh with Life Beyond, right, right, um, and and for those that don't know, this is sort of a Bitcoin-powered game coming up. Why, why Bitcoin? Why does the world need a game powered on, on Bitcoin? So first, um, great question. Uh, one of the things that we've all said before is we look at L1, L2s, and generally blockchains as kind of like national economies or nation states in and of itself. Okay. And so Bitcoin is a country, effectively. Uh, it has a very certain culture. Uh, and it has a very certain dynamic that takes place. And that's true basically for a lot of blockchains around the world. So but is this apples, oranges, and bananas here? No, it is, uh, it is about how we sort of, uh, sort of enter the markets in cultural context that we can then maybe export out afterwards. But if you want to sell into a market, imagine if you're making shoes for Switzerland. Well, you don't want to just make shoes just for Switzerland. You want to sell it to America. You want to sell it to Germany. You want to sell it to China, for instance, if you could. But if you were only ever restricted to one ecosystem, 
then you know you wouldn't be able to sort of expand your market. Yeah. So so that's one aspect of it. But you know, in this comparison, one of the areas that wasn't possible before ordinals was a way to store digital culture. Right? Right now, in, in the past, Bitcoin was very much the store of value, perhaps the preeminent store of digital value. But now with ordinals, you can store culture, you can store heritage, you can inscribe all sorts of interesting things about sort of who you are and, and, and sort of the, the prestige or whatever it is that you're building. Which so is, that's kind of the zeitgeist of gaming is this is. culture, right? It is culture. I mean, everything we do in gaming, which we're billions of people do today, is actually trying to sort of store those forms of digital culture. You could argue that every moment in game is a kind of inscription of some sort, for instance, right? Uh, and some of them are valuable and some of them are not, but most importantly, they mean something to you. And also, if you look at Bitcoin as a nation, there's a whole bunch of people on Bitcoin who will never leave Bitcoin for any other platforms, for instance, as well. So it makes sense to offer services there. When you think of market value, Bitcoin is also the one that has the biggest one um, of all. So and no one argues about it being decentralized across absolutely. You know, the, the exactly. world. So exactly. like, you know, um, that gives you sort of a freedom That's to right. be creative and to onboard That's from right. every country. And the way that I see of it is that the kind of games that launch on Bitcoin will have a very, uh, very different flavor about them because of, you know, if I was to translate it this way, the nation that is Bitcoin, right? In the same way that when you launch a game in America, it's going to look very different in terms of its feel and organization and commercialization as a game that would launch in Japan or China, for instance, because of the community that's there. And that's the same thing. You know, having a sort of a, a game like Life Beyond that focuses itself on the Bitcoin community and wants to be sort of inside the Bitcoin culture will give it a specific sort of narrative and a specific, I would say, domestic, as it were, domestic edge that, you know, if you just take a generic game and just say it's one size fits all, it's simply not going to make sense. And, you know, you guys are not sort of uh, stopping there when it comes to innovation. You put a considerable amount of focus and energy into creating Mochaverse. Mm. Uh, we have a, a monthly segment with them called the Mocha Moment. It's, it's a ton of fun. It's wonderful. Getting updates from everyone in the team and, and sort of sharing this very fast moving uh, locomotive train, I would say. Um, at the same time, uh, there's some really exciting developments that haven't really uh, come to fruition yet uh, with these Mocha IDs. So yes. I've reserved mine. I've shared with everyone I know uh, yeah. an opportunity to reserve. We just did a contest, but people are curious, what are Mocha IDs all about and, and why, why now with this particular movement? So first, you know, um, what Mocha, Mocha ID is trying to do is create basically decentralized IDs as soulbound tokens as a way to basically create really sort of sort of a way to not just onboard web to users, but also provide an identity layer that can be decentralized and can be truly yours in a manner that for things that we've learned in our own experiences. For instance, take things like KYC, a very simple example. You know, we had to KYC for several games because of the value. Well, what if you had an ID that was already pre-KYC? You don't have to go and KYC a new wallet each and every time. You just simply know that the customer is already KYC and it's okay. And one of the problems, of course, we had in the past was that you know people KYC and get the wallet and then they sell the wallet, right? And then you actually don't know if it's a real user, for instance. Yeah. Whereas then if it's soulbound uh, token, actually it does away with some of the issues of people basically, you know, doubling their identity, as it were, right? You know, wallets itself actually aren't an effective source of identity, but a soulbound NFT that basically represents your ID actually is much more effective this way. And then there's going to be a lot of perks, like uh, the way that Kyle described it to me, it's like uh, airlines program on web yeah. steroids. So the idea is that there's going to be... Um, or I think I described it him that way. Exactly. I heard what he said. Uh, basically, it's a way to sort of create your digital reputation uh, that can accrete over your ID so that you can know stuff about it. And the vision really about a decentralized ID is not that we control it, is that other people actually can now compose freely on top of it. So imagine a decentralized team. What would that look like? It wouldn't be that you have to use Steam to go in. You just have to know basically who the users are and you can target them directly. And it's more of a pull uh, marketing rather than push. For instance, every person who played a first person shooter, I'll give you a 10% discount if you try a first person shooter. How do I know you played a first person shooter? Your Mocha ID has that record. It has that history. It has all these details around it. So uh, the point is that- You, you can, can just be and do yeah. as a human what you enjoy. And people and will come to you. And, and people come to you. And offer you the products and services. You don't have to register a hundred times. Yes. You don't have to sort of keep saying, hey, yeah. I yeah. did this, right? right? And you know, we have over 450 investments uh, in the portfolio. We have also our own games and studios. All of them would be able to utilize and benefit in the shared network effect that Mocha ID will offer. Well, I'm excited. That's a little bit of a foreshadowing. The Edge of company certainly yes. has some ideas for perks we can offer this ecosystem. We look now, forward to that. It's not just limited to 8,888 
Mocha owners or, right. or a subset because a lot of us hold more than one. Yes. Um, which I definitely encourage you to check out, but this is for the entire world to get some benefit. Exactly. And of course, the next level benefit, of course, is that we want to teach people about governance. We want to teach people about the kind of power that they have with, uh, with a Mocha ID and with Mocha versus NFTs, like how we do it with ApeCoin governance and many of our other future token projects. A little bit less invasive than having to get your eyeball scanned too. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I think the eyeball scanning thing is somewhat, uh, and again, how is that stored and who controls it? And what yeah. do we do with the data? Do we actually know? Right. Uh, yeah. And what if that gets hacked? Because eyeballs yes. are becoming very important identity yes. mechanisms for secure, you know, things yeah. that you don't want to tap into. I mean, the way that we think of the future of identity, decentralized identity, is that we may be a way to connect other identity layers, but we don't know what's in it. So in other words, you as an end user would then give permission to say, I'm okay with you to take data from these 10 different sources or three different sources or five different sources, which we never have. And personally, I think decentralized identities on blockchain are gonna solve many of the privacy issues that people, that places like Europe have, for instance, because now you can truly guarantee that the company that might be managing your ID actually doesn't know that much about you. Very powerful concept. So you get to go home soon to Hong Kong because ApeFest is coming up, Yes. but there's gonna be a, a really exciting side event that the Mochaverse and Animoca Brands community is cooking right. up. Can yes. you just tell our listeners about that in case they wanna sort of book a flight? Yeah, so I mean, um, we're gonna have a little event in Mochaverse. I think it's a, it's a boat trip. From, 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 uh, it's been changing a little bit back and forth, but that's kind of what happened. And Sandbox is also having a very cool event on the third as well. Okay, cool. Right? Um, you know, generally speaking, I would tell everyone just come to FinTech Week because there's going to be tens of thousands of people coming in who are sort of Web3 enthusiasts and interests. It's not just ApeFest, it's Mochaverse, it's Sandbox, and it's all these little side events. You know, don't just come for us. Come for the fact that everyone else is building something there around that really exciting week. Come to Hong Kong. All right. Yeah, thanks for hanging out for a few. Good to see you, as Thank always. Thank you so much. Thank you.